Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Race Brothers podcast. We missed you. Uh, it's been a little bit of time. Uh, first of all, a couple shout outs. First of all, to Ari Pomerantz on hooking up these amazing microphones. What, what? Yeah, man. Thank you so much. They got great sound. You got great stuff. Um, check us out on what's going on on the YouTube channel. Please hit us up with a like, with a subscribe. Tell us what you like. Get some comments out there. And uh, we have a really exciting podcast for you today. So we're pumped. That's right. Today we're going to be talking about my, uh, my coronavirus experience over Pesach. And then I think we're going to get into, um, you know, what, is, what does the whole thing mean to us? And, uh, and at the end we have a little bit of a heated discussion about whether we should be doing Minyanim now or not. So it was fun. Hope you guys enjoy it. Have a good one. Looking forward to seeing. Be blessed. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Race Brothers Podcast. Good morning. and Good to see you all. Well, it's good to see you, Yehuda. It's good to see anyone at this point stuck in my house. I just watch people from my porch all day. I yell out, hey, what's up? And they're, it's good to see you. They're looking, they're looking up at me like, heck's wrong with that guy <laughs> um <clears throat> but uh it's good to be back it's been a little it's been a little while i actually had the dreaded coronavirus myself so uh, i was kind of down and out and um it's just been difficult to get together when uh you know and do this podcast when we all have our kids home and there's no time to there's no quiet spot. There's no quiet corner. It's difficult to make space and time to um, to get together in peace and harmony. Yep. But it's good to get together now. So cheers to that. Thanks for making that happen. Yeah. So we got smart. We woke up mad early. It's early in the morning. The whole world is still sleeping. Thank God. Yvonne, so Yaakov, tell, tell us a little bit about your uh, Corona virus experience well um my wife and i both came down with symptoms like two days before pesach perfect timing <laughs> right literally two days before pesach so badika's chametz i did i didn't do it this year i was in bed sick and sweating the truth is thank god i didn't have it too bad i had no uh i had no breathing issues the entire time it was a, i was a little nervous but i just came down basically with you know classic old flu symptoms um, fever, sweats, full body aches, headache, whatnot. Um, and, and my wife, basically the same thing. The only thing that, that, that was really terrible about this was uh, I completely lost my sense of smell and taste for a little while. And even now, it still hasn't really come back. So I can kind of, I can kind of taste very basic, like salty or sweet but I can't really differentiate in the actual taste. I made Kiddush on Friday night uh, on, on a glass of wine, and it basically just tasted like alcohol. <laughs> I, didn't, I couldn't taste the wine. Is it even this past Friday night? Yeah, this past Friday night. Wow. And even now, it still hasn't come back all the way. Like Some things I can taste more. Ketchup I can taste. Garlic I can taste, sort of. Yeah. But I made, myself, um, I made myself some sunny side up eggs. And I like a lot of salt and pepper on it. And all I could taste was the pepper. So I couldn't weird. taste the eggs. That is really strange. That is really strange. How was your Pesach like with that whole? Uh... So, 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 I mean, I got it like the day before, uh, the day before, the day, the morning of Badika's Hamas is when I really came down. I was really sick. I got out of bed. No, it was actually the day before that. I was working and I was just so ill. I ended up going to bed that night, just really sick. And the next day, it was just terrible. Um, I was in bed for B'dikas Chametz. My kids did it without me. Um, I made uh, my son Gedalia Shliach to, to do the B'dikas Chametz. And hopefully he did it. And I was like, all right, I'm just going to anything anyway. This is a bad situation, so I can't really do much. And then the Pesach Seder, I, I made it out of bed for the Seder, like, a, like on Erev Pesach, actually, a little bit before Pesach started. I managed to like let myself out of bed. Um, and actually said the whole Seder carbon Pesach and everything. I was just on a lot of painkillers, Acamol, no ibuprofen because I'm so nervous 
this whole big machloikas in the world if you could use ibuprofen or not if it makes it worse so i just right. stayed i just avoided it i only used the uh, paracetamol otherwise known as acamol here in israel that's the the brand name um but the pesach seder i just they pulled the table up to the couch for me and i was just curled up on a couch under a blanket the whole seder and it was rough i was in and out i i managed to um I managed to sort of be part of the conversation a little bit by Magid, but then I passed out in the middle and I woke up again. My family was up to Korech. So I was like on the couch, kind of under the table a little bit, you know, because it's much lower down. And it, I could just see like bits of matzah and, uh, and mar dropping everywhere on the floor underneath the table <laughs> from my position low on the couch. I'm like, what are you guys up to? Korech. Yeah, I can tell. As it filters down, you can see what's the detritus, the rain of detritus, little drips of grape juice everywhere, wine. My kids enjoyed themselves. They each had, uh, they had a good time. They had a good time at the Seder, but I was kind of in and out of it. I finally woke up and I managed to see like a Gazaya Zamatza, a Gazaya Zamara. I totally skipped Korech. I skipped Shulchan Orech. I couldn't eat anything. And then uh, if you call me, I'm like, you know what? Maybe I could eat a little more. So I kind of uh, forced myself. And then I benched, drank the third cup, and passed back out on the couch. I woke up. Gedalia was up to Echad Miodea. And I had my fourth cup sitting like above me on the table. I was like looking. I'm like, I got to drink that. <sighs> Pass back out. And I finally, like 4 o'clock in the morning, I kept on waking up, in and out, headaches, sweats. It was horrible. Finally, like 4 o'clock in the morning, I woke up. I was like, I'm going to drink that cup. I just said the bracha. I sang Hinani Muchanu Mazuman. Hinani Muchanu Mazuman. Hinani Muchanu Mazuman. It's big machlaikas, by the way. Some people hold it you're a snob if you say Muchanu Mazuman, because it's like, oh yeah, he's such a like a uh, Milleranic. Hinani Muchanu Mazuman. So it was a big machlaikas, but uh, I think I, I do Muchanu Mazuman. In my head, it was a big machlaikas. <laughs> anyway, I did Hinani Muchanu Mazuman, and I drank that cup. And then I uh, I passed back out. I'm like just that was my Pesach seder. Wow! But I did it. I drank four cups of grape juice. I ate two <laughs> kazaisim of matzah, one kazais of mar, and I said most of magid. So that's it. You did it. Rocked man. it. Hadul Hashem. Hadul Hashem. Yeah, it is. It's a crazy thing. And at that point, you couldn't even taste anything anyway. So it's just my, everything. No, no, no. Was- I actually still had my taste at that point. It's oh. weird. I had my taste still. I was, and I was like, I was getting better after that. It was like ups and downs in, in bed, out of bed. I, I took Acamol every like six hours. And then um, by the second, no, by the afternoon of Pesach, I uh, started to feel better. I'm trying to remember. Pesach was Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday night, Thursday. Wednesday night, Thursday. Ah, so Friday, we had Cholomoid here, obviously, in Israel. And Friday afternoon, I was feeling much better already. Shabbos, I felt much better. It was like very weak. After that, basically, my main symptom was weakness. And Friday is when I lost my taste. Hmm. Second day of Pesach. So um, after that, it was just just weakness. And my wife got much sicker after that. She was in and out of bed. She was, you know, she got the sweats and all that. But thank God, no breathing sickness. And my kids basically got very, very mild symptoms. So I have four kids over here. Um, very mild symptoms. Um, and actually, my, my youngest didn't get anything at all. She was totally fine. So, but thank God, we're over that. We're totally finished with the coronavirus. The only thing that's left is I still have issues with my taste and smell, but everyone else is doing fine. And uh, now we're just at the point where no one has any clue. Can you get reinfected? Can you not get reinfected? I'm reading obsessively every article I can get my hands on. And uh, nobody knows anything. It's really, no one knows if I'm, if I'm immune now. Maybe I'm immune for a little bit, maybe for a long time. No one has any clue. And the doctors here, by the way, I never got tested. None of us got tested. I called up, I called up Magain David Adom, like on the first night I was sick. I call them up. I'm like, these are my symptoms. Are you having any trouble breathing? No. I'm like, okay. Do you want us to send someone to test you? I said, well, you tell me. Am I supposed to get tested? Like, what do you want? You want us to send someone or not? I said, you, I called you because you're the experts. You're supposed to tell me what's going on. 
And this woman on the phone was just like, I don't know. You tell me what you want. I'm like, oh, forget about it. Don't send anyone to test me. I don't want to deal with that. But the next day I called back, I figured, you know what? Maybe I'll get someone who's a little bit more with it and actually knows what the protocol is. So I call back up and they tell me, oh, well, if you have no trouble breathing, just uh, hang out for a couple of days, see what happens, just and, uh, and then call your doctor if you have trouble breathing. And then we'll send someone to test you. Well, I never had any trouble breathing, thank God. So I, I never got tested. And then I tried to get through to, I tried to, get through to my, um, my local uh, health service provider. And uh, I ended up calling one night and they're like, oh, I call back in the morning. There's the, no rush. And they finally got through to the doctors after we, after we finished the whole thing. And we assumed we're still, people, people say that you, st you still need to get tested a few times till, till, you, till you test right. negative twice. Called up the doctors. My wife spoke to two different doctors. And both of them said, no, no, no. If you're symptom free for five days, you don't have coronavirus anymore. And you're, not, uh, you're definitely not spreading anything. So just forget about it. So that's it. We had coronavirus, yeah. never got tested, and I have no clue if I'm good now or not. I'm just going to assume I'm fine. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's one of the things that I find very interesting, which I've been reading, re reading about it a lot. And I don't know if we had it either, um, by the way, because right in the beginning, um, Daniela and I got sick, but I, I, I didn't think that it was corona. Um, but it's really hard to know because a lot of people have, you know, mild symptoms and whatever you re it's like a weird situation and some people get hit um but the one of the interesting things that i found was that they really don't know and they and and there's so many variables and unknowns that it, like it almost feels like you remember in in Mitzrayim they had kinim and by kinim they said etzba lo kimhi because they said it was too small for their you know, black magic to be able to, to affect or whatever it was. And, and they're like, Oh wow, this is clearly like a God, a God sent, um, you know, plague. And I feel like that's with, like this with Corona. There's so many things that they just don't know. It's like, you know, some people, I've, I've read articles. People say that people are, could still affect other people. Sorry. Can, are still catchy and can infect other people for up to two weeks after, you know, their symptoms have ended. And, um, and they don't even know exactly how it works and how it's mutating and what, you know, what the effects are. True. And they know nothing, nothing. It's, Nobody knows anything. It's ridiculous. I read an article today about uh, uh, a kid in France who definitely had, was tested positive um, and was in like three different groups of kids with a total of 170 other kids. Not a single one of them got coronavirus. They tested all 170 or they, or they just tested saying everybody. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's, it's a crazy thing. It's like, I feel like it's very, I mean, it's hard to, you know, we definitely, there's not, it's not like there's a pattern that you could say, Oh, I see it's affecting this type of person or that type of person. Like there's no, there's no patterns. There's no, no, there's definitely a pattern of old people, which is interesting. I've been wondering what is the, what's going on? I mean, with all the messianism surrounding this virus, which mm -hmm. is, you know, I'm wondering why, why old people? Why is Hashem taking away so many older people? I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. And the truth is that I, I don't even, I mean, it, to me, the, there's a certain level of that. Cer certain things, I think this is actually maybe a very interesting segue. Um, into into how to relate to certain things like um i know that there's a lot we could get we could talk about the messian messianism of this whole story we could also talk about the fact that it this has brought up a very interesting dynamic and how do we relate to certain things that we're supposed to do i think that there's a certain mentality especially a, among believers right if you have a beliefs in certain belief systems and that i want to live my belief system that i'm going to win win Right. Meaning Hold so on, I just missed that. There was a little bit of a cut out for a second. Just repeat that last set sentence. That there's a certain like, like that if you believe in a certain set of beliefs and you live along according to those beliefs, there's like there's a belief along with that that says that if I do what I'm supposed to do, I'm going to win. OK, so you have, let's say, um, a guy who's who, who believes that, um, you know, in, in, in avoid this Hashem. And so therefore, if I'm doing what's right, then I'm going to win. And what does win mean? Well, win means whatever people think it means. But for example, it means that let's say if I go to shul, then I'm going to be okay. And, 
And if I do what Hashem wants me to do, then everything is just going to work out. And what does that mean, really, right? Because because here we are, we are in a situation where Hashem's tell, Hashem tells us what to do. He tells us to dive and He tells us to do these things. On the other hand, when you when you get hit by a plague, suddenly those rules go out the window, and I mean, you have to deal with it. Meaning, you have to you you can't. You have to engage with physicality on a certain level. And so why am I bringing this up right now? Because, because we're saying like, you know, what's Hashem's plan with old people? Well, on the one hand, you could say, you know, maybe there's a specific purpose. On the other hand, when the, when the plague is out, certain people, there's going to be certain collateral damage. And collateral damage, according to the rules of nature and physicality, are that people with lower immune systems or that have aged o- older or people that are uh, immunodepressed, um, you know, people that have been sick with, uh, you know, and taking other, other things, um, other medications, etc., are going to be more prone to getting hit by illness. And that's just a rule of the physical nature of our reality. And then on the other side of that is that there's also a very godly um, hand that's driving all of this. And I think that that's, a, that's something that we really need to thresh out. And, and, and I know that for me, it's, it's, not, it's not simple at all. You know, for example, um, you know, if I was, let's say, let's say we were running this podcast. And for whatever reason, we were sent a challenge, let's say, not to do something. So would that affect the level of success? Yeah. Meaning just because you do the right thing doesn't mean you're going to always get the desired result that you want because I'm running according to the rules of God. Meaning sometimes... If you do something in the world of phys- in, in the physical world, you're going to sacrifice something. Meaning, you know, the people, let's say, when, when you know that came to America in the early 1900s that didn't work on Shabbos lost their jobs. You know what I mean? Like there's there is one natural effect of it. Now, were the people? Or do I believe that the ones that didn't work on Shabbos were heroes? Absolutely, they absolutely were heroes. But it doesn't mean that they're going to always be successful. You might have a guy who worked on Shabbos and he ended up making a ton of money and whatever. Like you, we have to, we, we, we have to open ourselves up that there's, there's, there's different sets of rules here. Now there were certain people that were able to, that were transcendent and transcended above those rules. And therefore when they lived a certain reality, the whole reality bent to their, you know, to their, to their thing, you know, they lived on a level of Eno Movado, et cetera, and so forth. But those were very unique individuals and not always was that true. What, I mean, not always was the truth of their living that way going to mean that they're going to win in the physical realm. Like sometimes it means you're going to lose and it's going to be very painful. Mm. Um, so, so, so I think that like, I know, so that's why I'm saying like the old people dying, I kind of, I'm not sure. I, don't, I think that that's just, that, that could just be an effective. I don't know if that necessarily has to be a simon. But there are other things that are coming out of this. Okay, look, everything, everything, everything is meaningful on some level, you know? And right. the, fact that, the fact that it's hitting older people and so many old Jews are, have, have <clears throat> passed away, uh, it means something. It's, uh, it's been sitting on my head for a while, you know? Definitely. I, listen, you know, the, the fact that some people want to want to interpret the problem is I, I have a hard time interpreting certain certain bits of reality in this way, because you have people that are like, oh, well, you see the, you know, the, the Jewry outside Israel is suffering so much more than the people inside Israel could be. I mean, we do know that. Good morning. Um, we do know that this idea of it's on Tia La Plata. And, and we don't know what that means. Does that mean now? Is that talking about that this is going to be, that Sion, Eretz Yisrael, is going to be a refuge for all the Jews that are here, that we're going to have less of a hit of coronavirus? So some people want to say that. Some people want to say that the people in America that are dying are because, you know, they didn't come to Eretz Yisrael. I, you know, there's, people can, can, try, can kind of morph all the reality that they want and, to, you know, you can ascribe meaning in whatever way that you want. But we have to, at least I know for myself, I want to put it through some filtering process. Well, no doubt. I was just pointing out that I, I find that to be interesting. You know, there's just right. a, there's a lot of interesting things about this. And I, you know, far be it from me to decide what things mean, you know, especially beyond, you know, unless things are, unless something pops into my head and it's like, oh, this is definitely what it means. But then anyway, even at that point, it's only what it means to me. And I could right. share it. I could say like, hey, it's, this is what I'm feeling. But uh, I don't know. I just found it there's definitely something to it and it's bothering me. It's been sitting on my head. Um, I, I would like to say that 
when I when I was talking to my kids about it, because um, we were, you know we have a lot of conversations about what you know like what what's what's happening with coronavirus and you know how is this going to affect us. So I was telling the kids, I was like, you know, one of the things for sure is that no matter what happens, even if it ended today, you know, miraculously, can you hear those birds in the background? Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. So even if it happened, even if, if it miraculously ended today, our whole relationship with, you know, cleanliness and being aware of possible disease would, would, would forever affect the rest of our lives or everybody who's alive now meaning you know there, there were such a thing as like you know there were you know when, when in the spanish flu of 1918 there was definitely a lot of effect and the people that lived during those times were very affected by those realities you know people that were affected by um, the depression they lived a certain way you know depression era cooking depression era you know like it, there, there are different things that are and all of us that are alive now are going to be affected for the rest of our lives by this without even without all the messianic talk and I, now I happen to also believe that this is a major transformation. And at the point of transformation, we can kind of get involved in the story of where we want this to transform to. And, you know, at a point of transformation, there's, there's a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of space for creativity, for, for you know, proaction. Like if we, 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 if we do things, you can affect it. Like, if we, you know, when, when, when a, uh, a ship is moving in a direction, you know, in a powerful powerful movement a little bit of guiding can actually affect a lot more than if you're trying to get a ship to start moving in a different direction um so one of my kids turned to me as i'm explaining about you know all the levels of awareness and and when you go out to the street you know, how you need to be aware of where your hands are and not touching your face and what you touch like right now when my kids go out to school they come home or if they went out before this whole thing nobody would remember where did I put my hands on the way out? But now when you go out, you have to think like, okay, where, where are my hands? It's a higher level of awareness. And so my son, Bensi turns to me and he goes, so you mean like Tuma Vatara? Now that's a very physical new awareness that's gonna be coming to people that we wouldn't know what to do with, right? One of the things of living with a base amygdash and living with Tuma Vatara is, is a level of awareness of where our hands are all the time that we're not used to. And suddenly we're being, we're being transformed into human beings that need to be self-aware of where our hands are at all times. What have you touched recently? That I think is very powerful. Yeah, cool. And I think, um, I happen to think that the transformation that we're going through I do think that we're, we're ready for certain, for certain big things. And we could talk about that now or later, but, you know, number one, numero uno, uh, Beis Amigdash. What do you mean? Beyond the uh, Toma and Tahara situation, what does uh, this uh, transformation have to do with the Beis Amigdash? No, I'm saying, no, first of all, the coronavirus, simply, it's getting you into a state of self-awareness or a term of Atara. But some of the other things that this coronavirus has been teaching me, um, so for, I mean, I think that there's this personal avoda, and I think that the personal avoda also has to do with the base of Migdash in a very big way. And, um, and I think that the transformation that we're going through now is, is going to take us somewhere. And personally, I think that if we jump on and if we help out this avoda, we can, we can help bring the Beit Samigdash. You know, six months ago, explain. Six no, months no. ago, the only people that were talking about the Beit Samigdash was the Temple Institute people in Yerushalayim. Um, you know, a few people in their homes. Um, you know what I mean? Like, it's something that I know that we live with, we're constantly talking about in the house, but it's not in a, in a, in a way that, like, okay, we're really ready to make it happen. We're, like, I really see it coming into the world. I do see it coming into the world, and I do see this process. But it seemed like there was still a distance, a gap that we need to close. And, and I think that on one level right now, I could see the world getting behind the building of a base of Migdash. Um, I could see the meaning with, with the, with the advent of a huge vi virus, a few things happen. One is that we're seeing that there's going to, that there's a large split happening in the world, um, you know, between China and America, between, um, you know, even you see Iran has been, you know, still doing their, their stuff and whatever, but, but America has 
the, the, the conversation that has been happening in the world, or let's say the American world, the conversation that's been going on, which has been, you know, this whole left versus right in, in one arena suddenly has changed. Suddenly we're hit with a, a huge squeeze. And whereas um, I think that the major conversation that's been happening was, am I comfortable or am I uncomfortable? And what will make me more comfortable? And what, what makes me more uncomfortable suddenly has been pushed to the side and said, oh my God, there's a life and death situation that's completely changing the layout and the, and the relationship of society as a whole. Now, now in some places like in New York, this has been, this has been, you know, it, it, to a very high level, people are like, Oh my God, there's death. I, people, I don't know. People have been seeing death all over New York in a way that the, the society hasn't been dealing with things. The news cycle, the conversations is all about, death and disease and plague and that is really intense for people where in their whole life was all about how comfortable comfortable am i versus how uncomfortable death smacks everyone in the face with a huge question which is what are you living for what's your purpose what's your meaning what's you know are you going to leave something behind but that hasn't been a conversation people have been running away from those type of conversations so that's a and b um, so now that the, now that that conversation has begun to change, and you begin to talk about purpose, meaning, um, and also possible meaningful solutions, uh, the idea of a base amigdash, the idea of building the third temple, for many people suddenly has become can become something that I can see even the Christian world in America getting behind. I could see Trump getting behind. I could see um, different countries in the world being split over this decision i can see this becoming a conversation in the world and i can see a huge level of movement happening um okay all right i mean it's i i i, I don't really follow the connection so much but one thing i do see is that lots of unforeseen things are coming out no one, no, one, no one could have ever predicted, no one ever would have predicted or thought that we'd be in the situation we are now. So, hey, that's anything can happen. Exactly. Anything can happen. And that's, that's, and that's really what it is. That In a time of great change, new, new opportunities arise. And that's what we're in. We're in a time of great change. Great, great change. Okay, let's, I want to bring this conversation back to a little bit more practical because, I mean, based on Mikdash's... I mean, even for me, I like talking about it, but it's still a little bit out there. And uh, it's still like, okay, it's still a big gap for me. And I think, I don't know, I feel like maybe the conversation that you've been having with people that are like-minded, it's a little bit of a bubble. I don't know how many people out there are, are talking. I don't like, I haven't seen the masses talking about a base of Migdosh. No, but it, it hasn't happened yet. And and what, what, what I'm saying is I think we're we're a bit away, but I think that we can... Because what I was saying like before is that because there's great change happen, because the ship is redirecting, we can now actually guide this. It's, there's suddenly there's new vistas and new opportunities that were not here before. And one of those things being opened up to that way that I see it is the possibility, the real possibility of building the base of Migdash soon. And that possibility, I believe, can happen if there is enough of, um, you know, a ground level effort of people that begin to have this conversation. Um, and I do think that it's not a lot of people. And I do think that it's, it's not yet, meaning as of right now, there is no big conversation about it. But I do think that it's bubbling up. And I do think that it's coming up. And I do think that the American Jewry um, has been asked a big question that they are going to have to answer. And and I think, well, all, all, all diaspora Jewry is being asked the question in a way that has been being, has been being asked over the last 70 years, really, which is what is home and what, is, what does Hashem really want? And suddenly now, for the, you know, for the first time, Israel is actually economically, well, I don't know economically, but physically kind of responding better than anybody else. Like they're rated number one where, you know, in Israel, people are getting frustrated by the fact that we're not allowed to do things because we don't see death and the, and the, and the COVID 
disease as strongly as everybody else in the world is seeing it. We have not gotten rocked in the same way. All right, that's true. And, that's- and, and the whole world is seeing that. And the world economy is dropping. You know, oil's, oil's below zero. I mean, no, no doubt that's due, to, that's due to like storage costs and whatever. But right now, I mean, how crazy that everybody, was, everybody said fuel, fuel is something that you're never going to have like an issue with. And now the oil industry is collapsing. Like what? <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. The Definitely airlines, large. the airlines that a few months ago were like the strongest industries in the world, are now being bailed out by 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 yeah, by um, international governments. It's crazy. I mean, the economy in America is crashing. The anti-Semitism that was has been on the rise for the last number of years around the world and in America. I mean, it's only going to continue to do so. We've seen this. We've seen this story before. That's Economic true. failure. I mean, you know, and, and that comfort level of living in Chutzlar. It's like at some point you got to say, like, how long am we holding on for? And then the question of real home comes in. And the question of home should for every Jew on some level, especially ones that are praying three times a day, at some point it's got to click. Home, Beis Amigdash, home for me, home for God. It's got to start clicking. You know, we're not just saying words. Okay, so speaking of home and, uh, and base amygdash, um, I, wa- I want to quickly move into another conversation that's being had by lots of people, and maybe it's a little bit more down-to-earth and practical, and that is the porch minyanim and the garden minyanim Ooh. and the park minyanim. Um, what do you say about that? There's been this conversation, especially I know in our community, where in another 20 minutes, I have a porch mini that I'm planning on heading to. Uh, so we have a hard stop in another 20 minutes over here. Um, but I've got this porch mini and it's been really fantastic. I wake up every morning, my window uh, it overlooks the front of my bedroom, overlooks the front of my building. And there's all these porches, terrace down the front of the building. And uh, we've been having this fantastic mini on them. Um, whereas other people have been saying how I've heard this bandied about that at this time when we're stuck at home, Hashem really wants our personal avodo and maybe we shouldn't be part of porch minyanim or, uh, you know, these, uh, impromptu minyanim. Maybe we should be focusing on ourselves and, um, to be honest with you, I feel on a very, on a very basic level, it's like. If you have the opportunity to make a minion and it's not putting anyone in danger, so then make the minion. What, what, I, to me, it's a no-brainer. I don't understand because you feel like, I know that people are saying, maybe you can explain the other side of this, but I'm going I'm to take my position, which is as long as you have the uh, opportunity to make a minion and it's not going against uh, any health guidelines and it's, not, uh, and it's, and it's halakhically workable i think you got to make the minion and um and just full disclaimer i don't go to minions that i don't like anyway so i'm not it's just not like i'm not i'm not coming i'm not like i'm not like a frummy it's like if i I don't like a minion and i have a hard time davening there i'm not gonna go on the other hand just if i can sure i'm gonna join a minion because you were supposed to daven with a minion so like the fact that it's not the greatest minion in the world, you know what? It's on my porch. I mean, all I got to do is roll out to the porch, slap my tefillin on, and start davening. Like, I, I don't understand why you would not do that. Now, could you explain possibly the other side of this argument? Um, yeah, I, I believe there is, uh, first of all, halachic disagreement whether porch minyanim are mitzarev. Okay, so I said putting that aside. Like if it's uh, if it's halachically workable, then you do it. If it's not, not. But that, okay, well, but I'm saying, but I think that that for, well, I think that leads that leads to it. Meaning that that question is the for, on one level, the question is, are you allowed to have a porch minion? So people are doing this because they. Where, where did the whole thing come? Like, did, who asked the shaila, of uh, of it? You know, when people started a porch minion, is it because people had this need for for doing? their norm do they feel that their normal um definition and experience of of religious um 
service needs to needs to go on because I don't know how to transform and be able to serve God in this moment unless by you know by meeting the moment I need to bring my story because I can't handle this difference and therefore I'm just going to do it now well who said it did you ask the Shaila is it, 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 our halacha, our, our porch is mistaraf. Are you now saying kedusha and kaddishes, and really you shouldn't be? Like, okay, so my neighbor asked all the shilas, right? and I trust him. He's a good guy. Okay, he asked his fine. rabbi. Everything is kosher. He asked about, and there's plenty of people. There's on me list, Mike. There's plenty of people who hold that. Uh, we even had fine. he has a sefer Torah in his house, and he does kriyat Torah from his porch, and uh, you call. Right, so up there are a number of people doing that, I, and I, I'm I, I don't know all the halacha. I just know that there is that there is a halacha question with it. Okay, okay, but again, said. see, you just brought up a thing, and you said, well, people can't. People no, don't no, I know said, what to do. Said, One second. You, you brought up the question about if people don't know what to do beyond their normal religious thing. Like people don't know how to dive by themselves. I don't care if people know how to dive by themselves or not. I really don't. The fact is that you're supposed to dive in with a minion every day. You're supposed to dive in chakras. You could baruchu, kaddish, kadusha, all that stuff, kriyas, Torah. You need a minion for it. And we know that Allah is you're supposed to dive with a minion if you're able to. So I don't really care. To me, it's like people, you know, whether you can or can't daven by yourself, or whether you feel uncomfortable davening by yourself, all right, whatever, dude. <laughs> the well, fact is, no. we're supposed to have a minion, so let's have a minion. Okay, so uh, agreed. The point that I was bringing up is, what is the, what was the, you asked me for the second side, and the second side, the, one of the first questions of the second side, which is, what's the drive, the need, in the minion, if, if, and maybe we you know when the halachic question, when, when there is halachic issues in question. That's the first thing. First thing is, hey, where is your drive coming from? You know, is it coming from a healthy place or an unhealthy place? That would be the first question coming from the other side. The second question coming from the other side, which I think is what people are having an issue with, is because there's been a an over um, overwhelming push to have minyanim and to do things in the in the face of of questions, meaning. I think it. Re, re, I think the conversation really start started when people were were kept on going to minyanim, and they kept on being in shul that were shuls that were packed, shul that were and there was a high level of people, um, tra, um, getting getting infected. I mean, the Jewish community in you know here in Israel. So it's like one thing. It's like okay, Bnei Brak got hit, but look there. You know, so many people got sick, but now so many people are getting better really fast. Um, and that was one community. But in New, in New York, the communities got rocked. And people were very slow on the pickup at, hey, we need to start social distancing. And, and the place that Jews are never, are always in social contact is in shul. And they took a really long time. And because they did not wake up fast enough, many, many, many people have died. And there were many rabbanim that said, um, that said, don't worry, keep on coming to shul. No Jew's going to die. I personally know someone very close. I'll, I'll tell you, he, he, um, our, our father kept on going to shul even after I told him. I said, Abba, you c- cannot go to shul. And he's like, no, uh, you know, this Rav said, and I trust him. I'm like, you can't trust a Rav. A, he's not a Navi to be able to say that, that, you're gonna, that, that no Jew's going to die. And then a few days later, the first Jew died. And so many Jews from Jews that were going to Minyan because they believed that that was the right thing to do because many people said that that was the right thing to do, kept on going and they died. And, then, and, and, and people are like really taking their time, took their time so much that the communities got brutalized. In New York, I mean, you saw, there were, there were, there were it was... Okay. But no, I, wait, I, no, it's not, it's not just okay. That's, that's, that's really where the question starts. And, and, and suddenly it's like, well, people are hanging on to being in a minion. And you're like, dude, enough. Wake up, recognize that this is a major issue. Now, now that, now that, now we're jumping. Hey, but you, the, one second. Can I pause you for one second, though? The fact that people are hanging on to a minion, people are hanging on to lots of things. And it's not, not, not just a minion. There's plenty of people who are hanging on to uh, what. You know, there's plenty of people who are not Jewish or not religious that That's were hanging true, on to their never, normal see, way of life also. See, no, see, like, that, that, is never, uh, that is never a good excuse, okay? Because I, my, personally... It's, I, see, it's not an excuse. I'm just saying it is. it's not unique it is to me. because we hold, we hold ourselves and to a higher standard. And anybody that, that, set, that stands up and says, I'm living my life based on a deeper purpose and meaning and according to Hashem and, and, and according to Shem, being Shem Mitzvahs, 
gets held to a higher standard. And anybody who has an issue with that, I'm sorry, that's part of what it means to live as a religious Jew is that you are a steward of the world and you are, and you are, in, a, you are in a position that you need to be more responsible. You can't look at me and say, well, we're going to shul and they're going to the beach. No, I'm that's sorry. That's not there's, what I was saying at all. There's no but parallel. Anyway, that's not what I was saying at all. So I'm saying, I'm saying the fact that the fact that that the, that the religious Jews that should have their eyes and their heads on a higher level and they should be straighter and we should be more tuned in. And when there's a halakhic issue, we should be more more ready to meet Hashem in that moment, which means if, if, if it means like, hey, there's a disease coming this way, we should be the first ones, Johnny on the spot. That is our responsibility. And the fact that we were holding on to it was, was from a le- meaning, meaning we should be in a greater state of das and self-awareness than, than any other community. I, I'm not saying that we're better. This is a really important thing. I believe this about myself. I hold myself to a higher standard than I hold other people to. And sometimes it hurts those closest to me because I hold them to a higher standard as well. But in any situation, yeah, I do. I put, I put myself, I hold the, the level of, of, of adherence to, to, to being a good moral person, to Shemir Torah mitzvahs, to, to being sensitive of others, others' feelings. I hold myself to a higher standard than anybody else. And that, I believe, is for every single religious Jew. That's what it means. That's what it means to be a, 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 an Eved Hashem. And so therefore, in this situation, the fact that we, w- we weren't tuned into it shows that our going to shul was just like they're going to the beach. And that is frightening. And that's something that can't happen. We need to be, we need to be much faster on the pickup. Okay, so now you're bringing up a point which I definitely agree with. But again, my, what I was saying is it's, it's, it, it's just it was, stand, it was typical human nature that people... I understand, and that show. is not... And that is something that we, ha- that we have to rise above, typical human nature. And if you're going to shul, it's typical human nature, then there's an issue with that. Because going to shul is avoid the Hashem. And when it comes to avoid the Hashem, you need, to be, you need to be thinking about what you're doing. You need to be conscious and you need to be aware. Mm-hmm. And we need to be making healthy choices. And if those choices okay. lead to this many deaths in the Jewish community, then we are, did something majorly wrong and that's a major wake up. And that means that we have to, that means that we're, that we, we have to be treated like cattle. Okay, and that's a, that's a scary thought, but like it means cattle. that, what yeah, mean? it means that, mean, like, like animals. Like sometimes you have to say to the community, say, no, I'm sorry, you can't do any of this. Meaning if you can't, the problem is that if you go, when you're going to Schultz, I, I, I went out to a minion that, you know, downstairs on the road for a Friday night minion to see what was going on. And you see, some people are able to social distance and some people don't know how to. Some people don't know how to be conscious and aware. I spoke to different Rabbanim about it as well, and I asked them, and I said, what do you think of that? They said, well, if you're with a group of 10 people that, can be, that are self-aware and are responsible, and they can be separate from each other, then like, Yala, what's the problem with keeping a minion? The problem is, is that most people are not living in a state of self-awareness. So you might be, and you go to the, you go to the minion, but then it's still transferring. Even when you bump into people, like, there's an uncomfortability, and, and, and people don't know how to do it. They don't know how to deal with the new social norms. They don't know how to be kind, be nice. I want to be nice to the guy. But you're not being nice to the guy if you're giving him coronavirus. Oh, but you don't know if you have it. Yeah, but you have to be okay, aware. So, so now you're saying it's a din of loy plug. Wait, is that because we're going, we're going some slow. people... We're going, so there's a bunch of issues. The first okay, thing is, I just want is to that clarify, we didn't respond. Cause... Yeah, the first thing is that we didn't respond. Second thing is that maybe there should be an issue of loy plug because, hey, across the board, we didn't tune into this. And, and once we get to the issue, the, you know, the Indian of like, Loy plug, listen, just stop all the minyanim and go to your house. Then we have to say, well, why is Hashem doing this to us? And if our first natural response in this situation was one of, was one of not coming from a state of higher awareness, and so now we're just having these minyanim, maybe, maybe the purpose of these minyanim or the purpose of this breakdown is to bring us to a state of higher awareness and trying just to hold on to some level of something before is really holding us back from being in a state of awareness. So I think that the other people or many people are expressing this issue and they're saying, like, why are you trying to hold on to a minion and hold on to some form of a minion? Maybe that is the shackle that's holding you. Maybe you need to be broken out and go, oh my God, what is my life really? And, and stop with all the holding on to things. Let go. And, and really open up and really say, what does Hashem want from me in this moment? And maybe trying to hold on to certain norms from before is it, people, other people are looking at them and saying, you're holding on to your norms. It's not a norm anymore. 
And so the fact that maybe you don't know somebody specifically who, who, who got sick or who died, like open your eyes. The entire Jewish world, the Jewish diaspora world has been walloped walloped i mean you know you know what it what it, what it was like when you know dealing with with abba and, and and on the phone and worried all day and and we all know we all know people friends and 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 family that have died from this this is if and and if you're just going to try to hold on to your old thing like dude wake up i think that's really what the, the what their issue with the minyanim is is like this is not the same and 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 living and trying to hold on to Anything that was before is not fair. It's, it's, not, it's not being sensitive to, to the message that Hashem is giving you, which is saying things are not normal and things are different. And what's going to be the change in your life? And when change is screaming at you in the face and when people are seeing this as, as, you know, as Hashem is screaming at us to change and people trying to hold on to not change, they have an issue with it. Now, all that being said, I do think that somebody who's authentic and real and open to everything that's going on, if they have a minion that they could go to, why the heck not? Look, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, and I hear the point, and I think I agree that... Sorry for the defi- rant, by the way. <laughs> no, it's good, it's good. I like when you get uh, excited. Um. As I was saying, I, I agree that very often, many people, myself included, we do things religiously. It becomes part of our, you know, mitzvahs and ashen milamada. We do things because that's just how we do it. And often we don't think about it. And I believe also that there's actually a very beautiful aspect to that. I think we discussed this in the past. It's a very beautiful aspect of yeah. that we have a framework of Yiddishkeit and we follow these rules, whether we like it or not whether we feel spiritually uplifted or not, whether we get the inner meaning of it or not. Um, <clears throat> and at the same time, sure, I, I get what you're saying, that nowadays when Hashem is, e- even though it's hard to ascribe meaning to things and it's hard to understand what Hashem wants from us, but yeah, clearly we're supposed to be um, separating from one another and clearly, we're not supposed to be going in the same shigra on the same standard, you know, same standard way we've been going until now. I get all that. On the other hand, uh, if you have that conversation and you speak to people and they get that, so then <clears throat> that's, the, that's the only way to, um, the only way to internalize that message is by having that conversation and by discussing it. But uh, to say that Hashem wants us to daven by ourselves, which is something that I've heard bandied about, Hashem clearly wants us to daven by ourselves. And even if you have him in and available, that's not what Hashem wants from you now. And what Hashem wants from you is to focus on your private tefillah. I, I can't say I agree with that. Um, if you want to say din of loy plug, so then halachically they want to say that because there's a, there's a danger uh, to society and people don't know how to behave when they're with other people. So, so we want to say light plug and therefore we shouldn't have any minyan because some people are not going to behave properly. Okay. That I hear from a luck point of view, but to say that, you know, that Hashem wants you to daven by yourself, that is not necessary. Like to me, it's just, that's overstepping the bounds of, uh, you know, it's overstepping. It's, you know, it's, you have a feeling, Great. That's your feeling. Well, it's but not if just you have feeling. an opportunity to join, yeah, it is just a feeling. If no, you have an opportunity, look, to all join the schools minion, are closed. Meaning, that's what they're saying. They're saying that once you see that all the schools are being closed, what what are you taking from that? So that's what they're saying. They're saying like, tune into what Hashem is sending you. Well, that may be so. So maybe tune into the fact that you need to focus on why do you care about going to Shul so much? Why is it important to you? These are good questions to ask yourself. But that doesn't mean that, you sh- that Hashem wants you to daven b'yichidus if you have an opportunity to daven with a minion. And that is what has been bothering me. People are saying, even if you have the opportunity to daven with a minion, you should daven b'yichidus because that's what Hashem wants. Because, but because- I don't know that that's true. Maybe Hashem is sending you a message and clearly is, 
you need to ask yourself, why do I feel the need to daven with a minion? What does davening with a minion mean to me? What is davening to me? Am I doing this just because it's, it's normal and it's because that's the way I was raised or is it, or is it, or is it something deeply meaningful to me? What do I miss when I don't go to a minion? Do I miss the fact that I can't say uh, Baruch Hu and Kedusha because those are important things to me? Uh, do I miss the fact that I can't connect to others and daven together? Or is it just, you know, I, uh, I, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do by myself. I, I'm used to davening with the shul and I don't know how to do it any other way. So these are good questions to ask. But to take that a step further and say, Hashem doesn't, clearly doesn't want you davening in a minion, I don't agree with that. I do not buy that. If, if you have the opportunity to dive in a minion and it's not, doesn't go against the health rules and doesn't go against, uh, you know, and, does, and, and, you, and people are being careful, then I think you definitely should dive in with the minion. <laughs> There's no reason not to. You want to ask the questions? Ask the questions. Bring up the conversation. That's fantastic. But I don't like when people take that a step further. So, for example, now what happened was the government over here now allows us, they're, they're starting to open things up, which is part of the process, and it's not, just, it's not just because they're kowtowing to religious people, part of the process of reopening society is opening things to the public in a healthy way. And one of those things now is they're starting to open up certain playgroups and certain daycares and various businesses, and, 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 and you're allowed to send people back to work up to a certain amount. So another thing that they op are opening up, what people want, is davening with a minion. And they're now allowing people to dive in with a minion up to a certain number with the, within guidelines. To me, that's part of opening up society. Just like they're opening up, they're now allowing 50% of the workforce back, back to go back to work. And they're allowing certain stores to open. So they're also opening up minyanim within certain guidelines. And when you come along and say, you know what? Hashem doesn't want us to be diving with a minion. I, I, don't, I don't understand that point of view. We're opening up society. We're reopening carefully, slowly. We've taken the... You know, people are starting to understand right. how to behave. And if this is opening up, so then go back to it. You want to have the conversation of what does it mean to dive in with a minion? So let rabbis get up and talk about what does it mean? What have we been missing? Why do we care so much about a minion? Why is it important to be with others? Important to be aware of others when we dive in together? Great, let's have that conversation. But why should we not reopen the minyanim when we're reopening businesses and reopening workplaces and when we're starting to reopen schools or playgroups, etc.? Let's reopen the minyanim also and do it carefully. Right, but there's, you definitely can't have everybody going back to shul. So, so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's so, a practical, that's wait, a practical wait, point. Wait, wait, no, it's not just a practical point because you have to realize that we have to, we have to, we're struggling with, with, a, with a situation that is, I mean, Rabbi Gershon Edel, Edelstein um, who's the leader of the Haredi world pretty much now. Uh, you know, Reb Chaim Kanievsky is also, but I'm saying Reb Gershon has, has been, you know, kind of taken over recently and been asked a lot of these questions. And he himself put out a thing. He, like, it was very, he was very kind of trying to juggle, saying, yeah, you can go to shul, but those that stay home, it, they're doing exactly what they need to be doing and it's exactly the right thing. And it's a very hard juggle because, we're in a situation where, where, where many times people want to, want to be able to do that right thing and they want to win and they want to do the correct story. And the answer over here is that while the correct story isn't so, it, it's not for everybody. Meaning, meaning to be able to say like, well, a minion's better, but only for somebody who has it in the situation that works for them like that's a very it's a very unusual thing in a world where they want everything to be very black and white and and so you're you you're what you're saying is very true and saying like listen like why why if you have the opportunity to do it why wouldn't you do it and i think that in general like i happen to see see, see that with a lot of things like you know in in, in it's it, it, we, well this is this is this could really this is really a much longer conversation and we really need to open this up and go on for a lot longer um but i think that right. we our time it has to be uh, continued yeah we have a hard stop now i i have a minion on my porch to go to and i'm going to go diving with my minion <laughs> so first of all i just wanted to say thank you um thank you again to ari pomeranz for these amazing mics um just they're awesome and they're definitely all the recordings, but I think this is our first official podcast. So thank you so much, Ari, Darius, the great, uh, may Hashem watch over you as you watch over us. Um, Amen. And uh, so that's, that's huge. 
And I wanted to say thank you to you, Yako. This was, this was good. It's good to get together. Um, great, great stuff you're, you've been pumping out onto, onto the channel. Um, you know, the, the halacha, the daily halacha series, and the um, Meshivas Nefesh, and the Through Fire and Water. And uh, Baruch Hashem, we have a lot of cool stuff. We've been, you know, hopefully we can get up to putting up more of the Besh Blast Tyras. And um, yeah, we, have some, we might have some special recordings if we're able to uh, edit them. Uh, from Pesach, a little bit of uh, a little bit of cool, cool recordings. Um, but as always, guys, we appreciate you listeners. And if you're able to hit the subscribe button, the like button, send us some good feedback. You know, every every bit of feedback definitely gives us a lot of chias, and uh, we appreciate we appreciate to know that you guys are listening. So be blessed. All right, peace.